Michael Boyles, strengthcoach.com presents the Strength Coach Podcast, brought to you by Perform Better, the experts in functional training and rehabilitation, performbetter.com. All right, hey everybody, welcome to episode 249 of the Strength Coach Podcast, the official podcast of Michael Boyles, strengthcoach.com, the world's best source for strength and conditioning information, brought to you by Perform Better, the experts in functional training and rehabilitation. All right, I'm your host, Anthony Renner. The show notes are located on my site at continuefit.com. It's where I keep all my resources. All right, on the shrinkcoach.com, Coach's Corner, I spoke to Coach Boyle about a few topics from one of his staff meetings that I watched on bodybyboyleonline.com, and that is he talked about being a performer. He mentioned a quote from Martin Rooney about being the lead in the show uh, as a coach, and this idea of no like, and trust. I also spoke to him about looking the part, which is one of his um, coaches minute rants uh, that he does on Instagram that we keep all together on traincoach.com. For the Results Fitness University Business and Fitness segment, I'm back on with Alan Cosgrove. We're going to talk about online training and kind of adding that to for physical gyms as well. Uh, it's an important part of what uh, I think, you know, where everything is going and you don't want to turn any business down. For the functional movement system segment, Diane Vivas is on to start a new series on bringing a stability solution to a mobility problem. She's going to talk about the foundation today. For the train heroic data-driven coaching segment, Adam Doughty is on with Tim Robinson to talk about being your best. So they're going to kind of revisit the segment they did on goals and going a little bit deeper on that. Okay, so bodybyballonline.com is now going to be my new sponsor for the Hit the Gym with the Train Coach segment. So... You can be an insider at Mike Boyle Strength and Conditioning with a membership to BodyByBoyleOnline.com. There are staff meetings, which, again, we talk about today with Coach Boyle. There's in-services from all kinds of people. Fergus Connolly was there recently. Um, Charlie weingroff has been there. Uh, just, it's, it's really, it's endless. And then uh, they always post all their programs that they're doing on Body by Boyle Online. So check it out at BodyByBoyleOnline.com. All right, today we've got Josh Hankin. He is the uh, inventor of the Dynamic Variable Resistance Training Program, as well as the creator of the Ultimate Sandbag. And we're going to, this is a long one today. I talked to Josh for about an hour. We're going to go over concepts that define the DVRT and just like movement over muscles and progressive overload. So much with Josh. He's just such a great, has such a, a brilliant mind. And he's really, I feel like he's done so much for the industry. So I wanted to get him on to kind of go over so many different topics. So, lots of things to get to. So, let's get on the phone with Coach Boyle. All right, now it's time for the ShrinkCoach.com Coach's Corner with Coach Boyle. ShrinkCoach.com, the world's best source for strength and conditioning information. You can try ShrinkCoach.com out for three days just to buck. You'll have access to all the articles, videos, and programs, as well as the best forum on the net. It's the only place to have full access to Coach Boyle. He's on every day answering and asking questions. We're going to talk about that today. Check it out at ShrinkCoach.com. Coach, how you doing? I'm doing great, Ann. How are you? I'm doing all right. Uh, I was watching your girls last night. Uh, Team USA took the first game of the uh, rivalry series. Uh, Hillary Knight, girl you've trained for a long time, scored the only goal. So I was kind of pumped last night watching that. I was too. We watched the whole game. It was awesome. And it was great that Hillary scored the only goal. And I, I told somebody today, in typical Hillary Knight fashion, she emailed me this morning about her, one of her teammates, Hannah Brandt's my zone being broken. And she never mentioned the game. <laughs> Unbelievable. She was, like, she was like, hey, Hannah's my zone is broken. Can you help me fix Hannah's my zone? Who can we talk to at my zone? And I was like, you know, this is typical Hillary. And then she's like, I miss you. See you soon. Very I was cool. like, okay. <laughs> By the way, congratulations. By the way, nice job scoring the only goal. But that's what <laughs> makes her so lovable. Very cool. And you actually, where were you, you guys were down uh, watching the All-Star game in Nashville, right? Yeah, we went to the NWHL All-Star game. We went to the Predators game before. We went to the skills competition the night before and watched the girls. And We actually had a great time. When I saw that they were going to do the All-Star game in Nashville, I said right away to Cindy, let's go and uh, hang out in Nashville for a couple days. So Michaela went with us because she had shoulder surgery and she's out of school. And so uh, we had a great weekend. 
Very cool. Um, and it was so great. Uh, we haven't been on since then, but another young lady you trained for a long time, Kendall Coyne, I forget her uh, her married name. Schofield. Schofield. Um, Schofield. Yeah, she was at the the NHL All Star Game uh, with, I, and I know a couple other girls were too. But she really kicked butt on that uh, fastest skater competition. That was so cool to see and inspired so many young girls. It was unbelievable. I gave her the biggest hug when I saw her because she did it at the skills competition too, and I saw her afterwards. And I told her that I was so proud of her because I, everybody who's been around her, I knew she could fly and I knew she could skate as fast as the boys because I've timed them both. I've timed NHL guys and I've timed her. And so I kind of, I wasn't surprised by that, but the fact that she beat a couple NHL guys in that competition was so good for the, just the whole game of women's hockey. So yeah, it was amazing. Very cool. Um, Coach, I want to talk a little bit about um, a couple of staff meetings on Body by Boy Online, uh, just a couple of things that are li- will lead into some of the coaches' minute stuff that you've been doing. So you had a staff meeting, and you were talking, um, and I actually just posted a, um, a quote from Martin Rooney that you had you had quoted in one of your staff meetings on Body by Boy Online. And um, what it was was just kind of talking about, you know, uh, you have to act like this is a performance. Um, like, and, you know, it, look, you're the lead. You're the lead to here, okay? And, you know, you have to act like that. And um, I just thought it was interesting because for sure you're completely different than Martin. Martin's like... Uh, I can imagine his coaching is, is a little different than you. Like when I've seen you coach, cer- certainly nothing like Martin would. He talked about you need to think of yourself more as a performer. You're putting on a performance and you're the lead in the show. How do you translate that to your guys? Because I know it's going to be a little different than from what Martin. Martin's like way super high energy. Not saying that you're not, but how do you kind of uh, try to talk to your guys about that? Well, one, you could say that I'm not. It's okay. Because <laughs> I'm not. And, and I will say sometimes if you look at some of those old meetings, I'll say, don't be like me. And, and I guess the difference for us is we're appealing to young coaches to come out of their shell a little bit and to be a little bit more vocal and to realize that they are in charge of the group because we'll have some people, because it has people move kind of from intern into their first coaching position who don't like to be front and center and aren't used to being in front of the group because they've never coached. So it, it's different suddenly. It's like you're coaching, and this is your team, and you've got to be up in front of that team saying, okay, this is what we're going to do. So in general, I always say I would much rather tell you to calm down than to get more excited. So I always look at someone and think I might single somebody out and be like, hey, Anthony, I'm not, I'm not worried about you. You don't have to get any more excited than you already are. Because in truth, I guess in one way you say, would I like to have – 20 Martin Rooney's running around? In some ways, yeah, I think I would. From a business owner standpoint, somebody that has that level of energy where maybe I might have to from time to time be like, hey, ratchet it down a notch here. But versus the flip side of, hey, come on, you know, give me project your voice. We always talk about things like coaching voice. You need to project your voice. You need for the kids to be able to hear you. You need to be able to bark at a kid who's not paying attention a little bit. You need to be able to yell across the room to somebody who may be 20 or 30 feet away from you and not quite doing it the way you want to. And you need to be able to do that in a way that doesn't sound angry. We had one guy who's actually gone on and had a very, very good career, but one of the things I had to take him aside and say, you always sound like you're mad, and I don't think you are. But you need to know that, that when you're, whatever, instructing somebody across the room, that it can't sound like you're mad at them and screaming at them. It has to sound like... I noticed you on the other side of the room and I need you to do X. So I guess it's an appeal to people who are going to be more introverted to be slightly more extroverted. Yeah. Anybody ever sees uh, Bobby Smith, some of his stuff too from Ripped uh, down in New Jersey. He's, he does a great job with that too. Like projecting a lot of high energy without making you feel like he's mad at you. And, And he was one of Martin's athletes. Oh, there you go. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so, and that's what I mean. So I think to some degree I look at it and think that you'd like for everybody to have a little bit of Martin, a little bit of Todd Durkin in them and and be able to really 
get people going, get people motivated. And that they generally, they don't get that from watching me. There's no question. And I try to make that point to them in terms of you don't have to be, you have to be who you are, but we may ask you to, to be the high end of who you are. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's it's great and it reminds me. There's two books I want to mention: "Steal the Show" from Michael Port, and I'll try to put these links on for everybody because I've been getting a lot of people asking about that type of stuff when we do talk about books to put the links on. But Michael Port, "Steal the Show," talks about having your own voice. Great job there, and, and that Alan Alda book. If I understood you, would I have this look on my face? And I think all coaches should get those two books. You'll understand about. That the, exactly what you're talking about right now, and you know what's interesting is in another staff meeting you were talking on Body by Boy Online, you were talking about no like and trust, and um, you know they got to know you, you know you got to get to know everybody. Number one, um, you know because people want to do business with people they know like and trust. They want to be coached the same way, so know everybody's name, have conversations that don't revolve around training, and build trust that you aren't going to hurt them. What's interesting is you. You put trust third. Just kind of give us an overview of, uh, like, somebody would say, what are you talking about? You got to trust. They have to trust you first. Give us your opinion on this. Yeah. Well, I, I think probably there's two ways to look at it. One, if they're at my coil strength and conditioning, they probably already trust us and trust the method. So it might make it easier for us to put it in that order. But also, if you look at any of these business books, They'll always put it in that order. No like trust. It, they know, someone's not going to do business with someone, or they don't want to do business with someone they don't know. People will always think, hey, I'd rather do business with this guy because I know him. And people would always think, I'd rather do business, you know, I'd rather do business with Anthony. I like Anthony. And then you're right, it's third, but it might be first. Eventually you have to think, hey, I might know Anthony, I might like Anthony. I don't trust Anthony. I don't know if I want to be yeah. transacting money with him or. or, or I don't know if I want him to be in charge of my training or whatever that is, but it's always been every time I look or every time I see it kind of in the literature, in a book, it's always no like trust. So I guess part of it for me is maybe just parroting what I've read. Yeah, absolutely. What I think is a great segue into um, you've been talking on your coach's minute segments which we do have them all on strengthcoach.com or you can go to coach Boyle's instagram but um looking the part now you know i think there's this part that not that you're leaving out but i think it's kind of the common sense part i mean if you do look the part yeah, it, it'll probably be, uh, you'll probably get more clients. There's a be, you have a better chance of attracting people. Doesn't mean you have to look the part. And same thing with training. Doesn't mean you have to train, but you probably should have trained. Like you talked today on your Coach's Minute with about interns uh, train, coaches coach. So we need some experience. We need to be the busboy before we become the bartender, the bar back before we become the bartender. Um, you, you have to at least done it at some point and still be able to, uh, um, you know, still be able to kind of get in the trenches, do some of these things, see how they feel for yourself, do it with your clients, et cetera, et cetera. But looking the part, there's, there's kind of been a lot of, it's kind of funny that people have a hard time with this one. Yeah. I think it's really interesting because my problem is I've seen this twice now on Twitter in the last say six months or whatever it is. And unfortunately it's usually a big football type strength coach who has a picture of themselves deadlifting or doing something like that that's saying these things about oh you got to look the part you got to walk the walk and and I just don't agree obviously you can't be unfit I don't want my personal trainer to be overweight I don't want my personal trainer to walk in with a Domino's pizza but at the same time I don't necessarily need a trainer who's shredded and my thing and this is where I get I had this conversation with a kid the other day and some people will get really super offended by this, but that's, I guess, my my stock and trade these days anyway, so I might as well live with it. But um, I think sometimes I had a kid the other day who told me, uh, you know, he was a competitive powerlifter. He said, I'm a competitive powerlifter. And I said, just so you know, I would consider that a drawback in, in terms of your resume. And I think he was shocked that the fact that he was sort of competing in an iron sport would be a drawback 
on his resume from my perspective. But I feel like once you become a coach, you should be committed to coaching. And if you need two hours a day to work out, to get your workouts in, to do all that stuff, you're probably not going to be the kind of coach I need you to be. I tell our coaches all the time, hey, do conditioning with your group. Get on the bike, do whatever, you know, 10, 15 minutes, bust out some tempos, do whatever it is. You know, get a quick lift in, push, pull, legs, core. Because I don't want them to not be in shape. I don't want them to not work out. But I also don't want somebody who's so focused on themselves. I don't think you can be focused on yourself and on everybody else at the same time. And again, the guys that are doing it will disagree with me. But I would look at it and think, okay, we're going to be in a situation where something's got to give. It might be your home life. It might be your family life, your, your girlfriend, whatever it is, your significant other. But it's going to be very difficult to put two hours a day of energy into your own training and then another eight hours a day into the training of everybody else. So I, I guess that's one side that offends me. The other side that is like, you know, you got to walk the walk, you got to train, you got to look the part. I'm, and I look at a guy like me, I don't look the part. I don't walk the walk. I don't really train. And people, you get away with that because you're Mike Boyle. And I'm like, well, the bottom line is Mike Boyle's been like that since the 80s. He hasn't really lifted weights. He hasn't really looked the part. I mean, I've I've been, uh, you know, kind of a relatively skinny guy who had glasses and was losing his hair for a really long time. It wasn't like that happened last week, you know. (laughs) And so, and I've been, hey, I hate to say it, I've been really successful. Way more than most people in our field. So I look at all that stuff and think when people say you have to do this, then I look at it and think it's just not true. You don't have to do this. Mm -hmm. And I want all the other kind of skinny pencil neck geeks like Mike Boyle to realize that, that maybe, and I just think like, I look at Daryl Edo as one of the best coaches that I know. I've never seen Daryl Edo pick up a heavyweight ever. I don't know if I've ever seen Daryl actually pick up a weight. Yeah. To be honest. I mean, I'm sure he probably has. I'm sure he lifts, works out, but I've never seen him as a guy who was sort of a gym rat type of guy who's in there all the time training and thinking, hey, I got to get my workout in. Craig Friedman was the same thing. Craig's more on the, you know, the intellectual side of Exos now, but Craig was one of the best coaches that I know. And I don't think, I don't, I never saw Craig as a guy who was obsessed with working out or getting his own workout. He was a good athlete, in. though. So, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Really good athlete. Yeah. I mean, I played, we had a great flag football game one time with uh, Chris Drury and somebody else, I forget, me and him. But um, <laughs> years ago. Uh, but he was. But my point is all these guys were good athletes. They were all really good movers. They were all really good teachers. They were all really good coaches. And they weren't a big meathead worrying about how much they could deadlift or how much they could squat or how much they could bench. And and the reality is a lot of the really good coaches that I know aren't the guys who are worried about those things. So I would look at it and I almost on the flip side say, I'm not even sure it's I mean, it's definitely not a requirement, and I'm not even so sure I would do it as a strength anymore. Yeah, I, th- I think two two points, like you did power lift at one point, so you did have that on your yep. resume. So it might be a good thing, like you said, okay, if you did it, great, you worked on it, but like if you want to be a serious coach, you know, your competitive days are over. I get it. Uh, also, I think first to market, sometimes I think I heard Seth Godin talking about it, sometimes being first to market uh, – is is a good thing. Is you know can, can oh, yeah. last without, without can question. Out, you know, but unless you're I an MP3 I'll be honest. I struggled early, early on, and and the fact that I was strong helped me. The fact that I could walk the walk, even though I never looked the part. I yeah. never. I can remember people always looked at me, and I I remember the story distinctly when Jeff Oliver was my graduate assistant. Jeff had just got done playing uh, in the NFL and in the World League, and he's you know six four and close to 300 pounds at that point. And people would constantly walk into the, wa- the weight room, walk up to Jeff and say, hey, Mike. And he'd be like, <laughs> no. <laughs> and he'd point over there at me and people would look. I can't tell you how many people met me and the first words out of their mouth were, I thought you'd be bigger. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not kidding. Yeah. Like all the time people would look at me and be like, I thought you'd be bigger. That's funny. And it's like, you don't have to be big to be good at this. You don't have to have a shaved head. You don't have to have a big deadlift. You don't have to have a tight shirt. You just got to be good at what you do. You got to be a good coach. Yeah. 
Well, we will uh, leave it on that note. So I'll remind everybody, uh, you can see some of those staff meetings on bodybyboyleonline.com. Coach Boyle's um, Coaches Minute have been on Instagram, but we've kind of bundled them all together on strengthcoach.com and having some great conversations on there. So, Coach, thanks for doing this, and we'll speak to you next time. All right. Thanks, Dan. I appreciate it. All right, right now at Perform Better, they have the Spend More, Save More sale. You get 10% off if you spend $50 or more, 15% off if you spend $100 or more, and 20% off if you spend $150 or more. Lots on sale, so you can double dip on kettlebells, sandbags, med balls, and ropes. They got all their popular items on sale. The next one-day seminar is in Boston on March 16th. That's going to be with Martin Rooney, Sue Falsone, and Mike Boyle. You can check it out at performbetter.com for all their products and info on their educational seminars. Welcome to the Functional Movement System segment. My name is Diane Vivas. Today I'd like to start a three-part series about how we may need to bring a stability solution to a mobility problem. In part one, I'm going to share the underlying philosophy that supports this approach to mobility on the training floor. In part two and three, We'll take a deeper dive with some specific examples and corrective strategies. Several years ago, Gray Cook and Coach Boyle started talking about the alternating pattern of mobility and stability in the kinetic chain, and how maintaining this pattern contributes to healthy movement. It's described as the joint-by-joint -joint approach, and also called regional interdependence. This provides some insight to how we can approach our programming from a practical level on the training floor. Specifically, it describes how the body is made up of a series of stable segments connected by mobile joints. We see this consistent alternating pattern from the foot all the way up to the top of the head and out to the upper extremities. For an example, the knee would be considered a stable segment because it's a hinge joint that primarily performs flexion and extension, but is more limited in the transverse and frontal plane. It lends itself better to stability and transferring forces. Now the knee is connected to the ankle which is a mobile dominant segment, with its multi-articular surface, it moves better in all three planes of motion. If we look above the knee, it's connected to the hip joint, which is another mobile dominant segment with its ball and socket joint that is designed to really move better in all three planes of motion. Now, if we keep going up the chain, we get to the next stable segment with the lumbar spine, where the vertebrae are designed to mainly function through some flexion and extension and are more limited in rotation and side bending. This is to provide a stable segment at the base of the spine in that lumbopelvic lower core area. Now we can keep following this alternating pattern, but let's pause and talk about what happens if the muscles that are supposed to support a stable segment, like the lumbopelvic area, are not doing their job. The body's too smart to let the lumbar spine go unprotected. So it will recruit muscles that are assigned to nearby mobile segments, such as the hip. The muscles that would normally be free to lengthen and contribute to hip mobility now appear tightened and limited because they're trying to provide some compensating uh, stability to that lumbopelvic area. I have many athletes that show up, especially when they're new, with hip mobility limitations, and it shows up in that active straight leg raise screen test. When the FMS exposes a limitation, many times the key to restoring mobility is to approach stability and motor control in a nearby stable segment. If we use this example here with hip mobility, we can see that there's some strategies that we could apply to stimulate some core engagement and sequencing. This allows the client's body to rebuild trust in the neuromuscular coordination that's needed to provide motor control to that lumbopelvic stable segment. When we're successful, the feedback changes and the client feels the difference immediately. The posterior chain muscles, many times hamstrings that we love to blame, that were compensating and appearing tight will now lengthen and you can see immediate improvement in hip mobility. Now the next step is creating opportunities for consistent exposure inside and outside of the session to contribute to longer lasting change. Restoring a better movement baseline allows us as coaches and trainers to execute a clearer path to our training goals and create the training experience that we're so passionate about on the training floor. I don't think there's many of us that became strength coaches and trainers to be a corrective exercise specialist, so to speak. But bridging the gap with good corrective strategies allows us to be more successful 
by guiding our athletes to better ways to adapt and be durable day in and day out. That's it for today. My name is Diane Vivas, and this has been a Functional Movement System segment. For more information, check out functionalmovement.com and join me for part two, where I'll give you specific examples for corrective exercises targeting stability solutions for a hip mobility problem. Take care. Hey there, this is Adam. And this is Tim. Welcome to the Train Hook Data Driven Coaching segment. Let's go. So, Tim, let's go back to a topic we uh, we mentioned a while back, which okay. was the idea of goals. Ooh. Let's flip that on its head for a second. So, Alrighty. one thing at Train Hook we always say is be your best. Yep. And one thing that means is showing up and controlling what you can control, mm -hmm. which is the present, because yep. you can't change the past and the future doesn't exist it yet. It hasn't happened yet. So, you, you can control now, and that's about it. Right. So, Goals are interesting because really your goal should always be to some degree focused right now. Yeah, absolutely. And that's kind of how I set up my goals in coaching was we would always, we'd set, you know, standards, which are different from goals or expectations, right? So every day you need to be accountable and self-accountable. So accountable to your teammates, accountable to yourself, uh, disciplined in every sense of the word. You have to be respectful of yourself and be respectful of your teammates. And if we're all doing that all the time, you're going to have a strong culture that's bound to win. And that means focusing right now. Obviously, we won't all want to be all conference players or lose 20 pounds or PR on the squat. But in order to get there, you have to be focused in the moment because that's all you can control. And we use things like readiness surveys so I can get an idea of how that athlete's feeling or even like little competitions with some auxiliary exercises, leaderboard events and train heroic. Set that thing up so there's always a sense of urgency to live up to that expectation in the weight room. Right. So, you know, one thing I think that, that's really important is the way we talk about this. So okay. if I come into a train, you know, to a training session mm -hmm. and I'm tired or, you know, whatever, I'm sore or right. I'm just, I've got some accumulated fatigue. Or bound to stress, happen. It's bound to happen. Right. And we're talking to people who aren't novices anymore. So they're not just adding five pounds to the bar every time. Sure. Right. You're going to have days where you don't hit your numbers. You don't yeah. perform to like your normal expectation. Sure. And the way you talk about that is really important because was that a failure necessarily? Yeah, I mean, I don't think you could think of it as a failure as long as you went in and you gave that thing your all. You know what I mean? So uh, failure's a dangerous term in my opinion. You know what I mean? So g give it your all. That's what I'm looking for. That's what the data, uh, that's what I want to look at. Right, but like, so in this, you know, optimized world with all this data, right? <laughs> it's one of those things where like, I know literally what I should be capable of on sure. a good day. Yeah. And who hasn't gone in and, you know, gotten up, warmed up to something like, you know, 70, 80% and been like, oh, this feels like garbage. Right. I'm just going to go home. <laughs> Who, honestly, yeah. who among us hasn't done that yeah, themselves, right? Totally. And that's kind of the opposite of what we're looking for, right? Like you should go in and give that thing your all no matter what. And right. by like taking these preemptive surveys, readiness and things like that, you'll have an idea right. if you're fatigued beforehand. That still doesn't mean you can't go in and give it 100% sure. effort. I, so maybe you have to change your expectation. Maybe sure. you alter your training to some degree. But again, it's still about showing up and doing doing your best and doing the thing that was right that day. Absol know? Absolutely. And, and, and you as a coach... It, it, it is important to set goals in the long term, but don't forget about some tangible data points that you can use right now for the athletes so they know that every second they're in the training space or on the practice field that they're, you know, ever working towards that goal. Right. That's going to do it for us today. Go to trainheroic.com to start your 14-day free trial. When you're talking to one of our representatives, be sure to tell them the Strength Coach Podcast sent you for 10% off a year of the Pro or Elite Edition. All right, now it's time for the Results Fitness University Business of Fitness segment. We're changing this up here a little bit. I'm kind of taking Alan and Rachel and, and doing some little mini interviews with them on a topic. So, Alan, thanks for coming on and doing this. I oh, appreciate it. I love these. All right. Well, you know, um, I've been talking to people a lot about online training. And, and one of the things is, you know, look, it's not just because Train Heroic is one of our sponsors. And the reason why they're a sponsor is because I believe in, in, in their product. I use it for all my guys that I have that I train once a week so they can train at other gyms or at home. And I just believe, you know, when you said this a long time ago when you were trying to convince them, you know, back in the day when people weren't training um, like semi-private, they kind of thought you had a match three 
three people, but it was like, old lady comes in, wants to just get moved better. Yeah, we do that. Jiu-Jitsu player mm-hmm. comes in. Yeah, we do that. You know, a hockey player comes in. Sure, we train hockey players. Come on down. And so I think one of the things now, it's almost like you can't say no to this. Like, it's it's out there. Everybody's doing it. I think a lot of people always have this, well, you can't give quality programs if you can't see them. You know what? They're going to go somewhere else and do it anyway. Well, yeah. Well, let's answer that yeah. right away. I, I agree 100% that, that an online, and, and I think anybody who's offering online training who doesn't agree with this is, is, not, is lying. You can't do as good a job online as you can do in person. But you know what else isn't as good? A book. And yeah. I've written a whole bunch of training books. And you know what's even less effective than that book? Is the single workout that you would get in a, in a fitness magazine. Yeah. Right? Where it's, there's no context. It's no, it's no three days a week or six months or periodization. It's just a random workout. And what's even worse is people just winging it on their own. So, yeah, at one end, an in-person... Um, like, like, I've, I've had a, a doctor renew a prescription online. Right, without me having to make another doctor's visit, that is way more challenging than what we do. So we could we could think of it as a continuum, Andy, right there. For yeah, an, an in-person training is is the the gold standard. And as we come down, maybe seeing someone once a month, and then they train on their own in between is next. And then you got people. Maybe you you meet them. Uh, once every three months to someone you've never met. But you know what? Right now I can send you a video from my phone to you of me doing a lunge and going, hey, am I doing this right? And you can correct me almost in real time. So that idea that you're not seeing them starts to go away with the technology nowadays. Amen, amen. Right? Like it's that argument. So we like, uh, I have this this thing is that what, what do you give them? Like think of the price points. Like you buy the new rules of lifting and I, I'll answer some questions, uh, you know, when people contact me and if, if, you know, they come out or they meet me, but I'll be quite honest, if you bought a $20 book, that does not entitle you to unlimited consultations, <laughs> right? But as we move up, like online training, I think I think that what we've done in the past is it was uh, people only trained online, whereas I feel now it's kind of like all my clients at the gym kind of train online too because we have a Facebook group where they ask questions. Yeah. And they, we'll upload videos and stuff. And they, we're, with my my uh, business coaching group, a lot of that's delivered online, right, through through Zoom calls. I don't know if you ever heard of Zoom. It's a pretty cool thing. Right? <laughs> uh, just for everybody listening, Anthony introduced me to Zoom. But you've got these – think of these things as different delivery systems. So, yeah, I, I think, like, the elephant in the room is, yeah, it's not as good as in-person training. But that stops – that argument starts to go away because I can't afford in-person training. Or I've moved away, or I travel two weeks out of the month, or I'm a college athlete that you see in the summer, but I still want to work with you. And you know what's pretty cool is you start seeing, I've got a a client right now, a member of the gym right now, who comes and pays our fees, but he's actually one of Eric Cressy's baseball players, and he's just, this is where he's been training this this off season. So what does that count as? Is that an online client? Well, he flew out to Eric's place and got his program and got evaluated, and then he sees he comes and trains at our gym, and we check in with him occasionally. Where does that fall? Is that not effective? So I, I'm with you. As I think it's a, the the old argument used to be like I'm a I'm a busy trainer. I I that's not as effective. I'm like I I'm I'm not debating that anymore. I think in person is always more effective. However, there's a market for people who don't want one-on-one or can't afford it or can't afford small group or maybe their schedule just means they can't come to the gym who would still love your input and helping them. I think it's the, the world has changed. It's something very viable. Uh, we do a little bit of it at Results Fitness. And I'll be honest, only because we're pretty busy day-to-day with, with in-person clients and other stuff. But we have people that are maybe come and see us, you know, once a month or once every two months, and then they get their – it's just online support after that. Yeah. Right? What about- Let's say if you've got a bunch of clients in our gym who I don't actually see. I've got a, I've got an obstacle course racing team, a, a Spartan racing team, who are all gym members, and I see in person – maybe one or two of them in the month. Everything else is I write the workouts, they're posted in a Facebook group, I write the interval training, and they get back to me with their times. That's it, online training, guys. 
Like the idea of it in the past for us sent an email with a Word document attached to it, that's online training, but that's garbage online training. That's not how it's done anymore. Yeah. Now it's done with YouTube videos, uh, Zoom calls, Facebook groups. So, yeah, um, I'm sure that, and this is the cool thing with with, with being on on the podcast regularly, uh, and it's also one of the bad things in the internet. I'm sure I've made a negative comment on online training in the past. Right, because it, I always felt it was so time consuming for me as a coach because we couldn't just shoot video. I couldn't upload the exercises. Yeah. Right? I had to type them all out and, and it was it took me longer to do it at a lower price point for less results than my in person clients. That was true then. Now that's not true. Yeah. Right. So I think now it's um I I think you'll start to see that your your existing clients will have contact um digitally online somehow to either through nutrition or, you know, what should I do on other days? What should my running look like? Hey, I'm feeling so. I think it starts to become combined in that, that I want to be the, the complete service gym or fitness facility where we have these multiple touch points where you can come in at any level. You might just come in and use our facility or you might be every workout I want supervised, right? To something in between. So I think it's uh, the, the criticisms against it are, are just not, they're un- completely unfounded nowadays. Um, you know, my it's funny, my niece just asked me a question about, she's reached that age where it's time to tone, tone the stomach, you know? <laughs> and she sent me a video of her trying to do planks and side planks this morning. And I'm like, well, you go, I'm online training, right? Yeah. <laughs> right? It's, it's, it's the, the old days was it was you're sending a Word document with exercise descriptions. Now you're sending video, you're doing Facebook groups, you're doing real time. So 100% uh, definite viable income stream and uh, really solid adjunct to your your in-person programs for sure. Absolutely. All right, well, that's going to do it for the Results Fitness University Business and Fitness segment. But guys, remember, you can check them out at resultsfitnessuniversity.com. All right, now it's time for the Hit the Gym with the Strength Coach. And today I have on Josh Hank, and he is the creator of the Dynamic Variable Resistance Training Program, and also the creator of the Ultimate Sandbag. And what we're going to talk about today is I think a lot of people think that, you know, uh, with the Ultimate Sandbag, it's just, you know, Josh is now just a sandbag guy. And it's it's really not. If you see him speak, and that's really what happened to me. I saw him speak this year in Long Beach at the Perform Better Summit, and I was like, man, I really need to get into, you know, the DVRT system because... Um, there's so much to it and we're not even going to scratch. We're only going to scratch the surface here. Uh, it's not just about sandbags. So Josh, thanks for doing this. Oh man, Anthony, thank you so much. It's an awesome platform to be a part of. You know, I think, um, uh, it's interesting because there's going to be some people out there who would be like, ah, come on. It's just a sandbag. It's just another tool. And I, I, I even was, um, at first I was guilty of that in terms of, um, this idea of, you know, um, Hey, look, it's cool. I can do a lunge with a kettlebell and I can do some dumbbells and I could, I could, uh, uh this is going to get Josh mad, but, um, I can, I can use right. a different piece of equipment to add variety. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but that's yeah. not programming. But so I want you to start to just give us this idea um, let's actually start out with functional training because I like the way you define it and the misconception and, and, you know, talk to us about how other people or, you know, the, some trainers will say what functional training is, but I like what you guys, how you guys define it. I appreciate it. And yeah, I mean, I don't blame people for having that uh, cynicism or having that perspective initially. I mean, I, I've had that probably about tools as well. And sometimes I've been right. Sometimes I've been wrong. Uh, so I think we all go through that process. Yeah. And I mean, we all start with this idea of functional training and, you know, I think, you know, we're really bad historians about our own industry. And so I think a lot of people, they just don't understand where things start off and why they came about. And so then therefore when a, a term I, I say gets hijacked by the internet, then it just becomes this buzzword that, like, you know, I always joke, if your grandma starts using it, then you know it's really been taken over. Like, <laughs> I've heard, you know, these two older ladies years ago in a grocery store talking about their core workouts. And I'm like, oh, yeah, okay, they don't, like, they're talking about their abs. They don't really understand what core means. Um, you know, functional training, I think, is sort of on that same perspective where, you know, if you look at the brief history of fitness, which – as a profession, it's a very brief history. Uh, if you think about like 
the fact that I think it's the American Beautician Society was founded in 1936. So people that do hair, nails, and so forth, that was founded in 1936, and the NSCA is was founded in 1979. So I'm like, as far as actually a profession, it's really young. Uh, and I think that's why we have, you know, a lot of these poor definitions and understanding of, of variables and understanding of the science of what we actually do. So to answer your question, so functional training basically came about, you know, some will argue it was like the 70s and 80s. It was basically a backlash to a lot of the machine and, and more as it became more popular because of machines, isolated bodybuilding training uh, that, you know, physical therapists, especially, you know, like we were talking before the call, like Gary Gray, I consider him one of the fathers of. Uh, functional training realize that's just not how we move in life, mm-hmm. right? This is not how our body is supposed to move. It's not what we do. So why are we train the body this way? And so they developed, started this model of functional training. Now, as you and I both know, that's our game used by everyone that was just using it for anything that didn't look like a normal gym exercise, right? Yeah. That, that must be functional. Yeah. Uh, and, and so, I, no, and so then it became one of those things. I think, you know, you and I have seen the pendulum swing back and forth and a lot of different things. And so then it went from being a hero to being a villain, right? Uh, this is the guys, there's no such thing as functional training. Everything's functional, blah, blah, blah. And what I always tell people is like, when I ask people, what does functional training mean? They'll give me a definition along the lines of training for real life. And that's an awesome philosophy, but it doesn't tell me anything about your methodology. So when I say, what does that look like on paper? What does that look like as a program? What are the principles? That's where people get really stuck. And then they they like, well, what what, what do you mean? What do you mean? And so I go, you don't really understand what functional training is. And even people like Gary Gray, that's not how they defined what functional training was. So, you know, I try to keep it really simple. And it took me years to sort of find a better way of communicating it, which is simply, you know, it, the, the, the definitions in the namesake. It's to improve the way your body functions. Now, here's the problem. If you don't know how something works, you can't make it better. So I think a lot of trainers, they know some muscles and, you know, some may know more than others and they may even know origins and insertion points and, you know, some may even go posterior chain, but that's still far from how the body actually operates. And, you know, I hate when people go, there's nothing new because we're learning more and more about how the body operates and the role of the nervous system all the time. So there's tons of new information coming about how the body actually functions. And as we start to sort of gain understanding of that, then our exercises need to evolve to actually address specifically how our body works and basically think about how we're using load, how we're using exercises, what are we trying to accomplish, what are our progressions, what are the variables that we're looking at, and then all of a sudden it becomes a system. And then when it becomes a system, then I can actually look on paper and you and I can both have a conversation about a, how is it functional? B, what maybe problems we need to solve, or and C, progressions. Where where are we going with this program? And it's a better, much better conversation. If you just give me a workout program, I don't know anything. If we don't agree upon what the variables are, what the goals are, what what, what we're trying to accomplish, then it becomes a very hard way for us, the industry, I think, to grow and evolve. Yeah, I agree, and I think uh, it kind of it does open your eyes. Like even reading your definition. In, in the course, compound movements target at improving movement efficiency based on the natural patterns of human motion. It's not just saying, hey, it's life. I mean, these are, hey, guys, here, we need some compound movements. We need to improve movement efficiency. And w- based on what? On what we're doing with human motion. Um, yeah. I love that. And we, barely, and we barely get to that point, right, in our conversations, generally, yeah. right, on the uh, uh, I'll say on the line for anyone that remembers my best one reference, but uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's just one of those things that as soon as people hear the word functional or whatever, or they see something they don't understand, then they immediately dismiss it. And I mean, we get that all the time on social media, we'll post stuff and I'll try to explain what we're doing. And, you know, it just, it, it's either it's over people's heads because they just aren't familiar with these concepts or people just, you know, I, I'm all for making things simple, but I think simple is relative to your knowledge base. So, I'm, I, you know, if you're trying to teach a first grader math, it's way different what's simple than if you teach a college senior <laughs> basic math, right? Like what you can offer them, what you can teach them, where you can go with the information is different because their, their, their knowledge base is different. And I think the same thing with professionals. So I hate when people dismiss things just because they don't understand it. They can't put it in their context of their own current box. And you have to understand, like I always make the joke, I don't know anything about cars. Like I know two things, right? I know how to keep gas in them. I need to know you need to turn on the ignition. So if your car breaks down, 
guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to put gas in it and I'm going to turn on the ignition. Like that might work, but I'm completely guessing. And I think that's how a lot of people actually approach training. They have a couple of exercises, you know, a couple of things. They really hope those things work. <laughs> you know, yeah. if they don't, they don't really know what where, where they're going with things. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's true. And I like it. Hey, look, I've been guilty of plenty of that. And even, even I think, of you course. know, social media, oh, like we can look at some of your, some of your things. And if you don't understand the system or if you haven't like really kind of got into this again, I was guilty of this in terms of saying, I really like the sandbag in terms of it gives me, look, I have older guys too, like with, mm-hmm. with my golfers. So it, it's, it's a much safer way to get some, some speed work in like, like cleans, um, it's mm-hmm. also uh, a way to kind of train different grip positions, which is important for golfers. That's why I liked it. So and, and there is this idea of variability that I did like, and there were some new exercises that I could do. But once you start unpacking what you're talking about in the dynamic variable resistance training program, then you start to see what makes sense. Some of the stuff that you put on line where if, if I just looked at them, I'd be like, what are they doing there with, you know, right. the, the, the bell in the right hand and the, or the kettlebell in the right hand and the sandbag on the left shoulder or whatever. And it looks like, and you know, and with, with a mini band on, you know, like somebody yeah. might be like, Oh, that's, that's stupid functional training again, without really right. understanding where you're going. Oh, no, absolutely. And, and then I don't want to like, like I'm, uh, uh, absolved from doing the same thing to other mediums. But I think what end up this sort of process and journey has taught me is, is a few things. And, and one is like, you know, when people decided on using a tool, you know, can you imagine if you're getting surgery, Anthony, and your, your surgeon, if you're awake at the, at the time and goes, give me a scalpel or a clamp, it doesn't really matter which one I'm using. Yeah. Like, that'd be pretty horrifying, right? Yeah. And even at a lesser degree, if you had a contractor at your house building an addition and they said, and you saw them using a screwdriver for the job of a saw, you'd be like, you don't know what you're doing. And yet, when it comes to us actually addressing people's bodies, we think just any tool is fine because we sort of all bought into the soundbite that weighs all equal, even though at the same time, we'll disagree with that same commentary in five seconds when we show specific examples. And, you know, my whole thing, too, you know, I've been a facility owner for 10 years before really getting into this. And if you go down the road of, like, there's no real purpose to your tools, then that's an expensive business model that you're just getting tools just for variety's sake, because that means you're just constantly have to buy things and what and you know this better than most like what's the one thing you can never replace in your facility is space so whenever someone invests into a piece of equipment to me it's got to address a unique issue that something else does not do and when you pick a tool and it's not always going to be the ultimate sandbag but when you pick a tool it's got to do things better than anything else does i think until we can start answering that questions professionals we don't really value our tools so having a big toolbox is pointless if you don't understand the value of those tools Absolutely. You're right about the space for sure. And as we, uh, you know, as, as real estate prices go up and it's harder to, yeah. to have that space, you really do have to kind of pick, pick your, your weapons, uh, wisely there. I, I love the way you put like, like you, in the, in the concepts that define DVRT, you were talking about movement over muscles and somebody, like you said, this isn't a new concept, right? Um, no. No. but you found that few actually implement it into their programs successfully because they fall into two sides of that functional spectrum. Can you just give us an overview of that idea? Sure. I mean, I mean, I, I think like we're all proud of ourselves and we're patting ourselves on the back because a lot of us are focusing on the, you know, the seven primal movement patterns, which if people are unfamiliar, just so we're all speaking the same language, you know, hip hinge, squat, lunge, push, pull, uh, rotate and gait. And it's so funny, like we all excited about that. And Coach Doe has a great thing. He's like, you know, the our industry loves we love stuff like this because if there's seven good topics, then why don't we just make it easier to do four? Eh, well, if four is good, let's just do one. And it's yeah. like it doesn't work that way, right? Like yeah. you can't start eliminating movement patterns. And the reason I bring up the movement patterns too is because if I asked you, you know, for all seven movement patterns, which one are we most designed to perform? I get all types of questions from coaches. I'll get deadlift. I'll get squat i'll get things like that but then you know i go what do you do the most of in every day in life and it'll be oh we walk and then they give me a confused look right like wait so where are you going with that what do you mean you walk and i'm like 
well, actually, the six movement patterns actually all lead into gait. Like, no one, now I realize no one goes to the gym and goes, hey, today is going to be a badass gait day yeah. for training. But gait uh, sort of encompasses a lot of different things. And so it's just not, it's, you know, I'll give you an example. I was talking to uh, an Equinox group and we were going over this and, you know, we were going over the movement patterns and someone was confused. They're like, hey, you know, you have gait, you don't have loaded carries. I go, well, loaded carries aren't exercise. Gait's a pattern. So, and they're like, their head just like, they were digesting what I just said. I go, listen, a gait doesn't have to be actual walking pattern, right? Because, for example, a dead bug is a gait pattern. A bird dog is a gait pattern. Mm. There's elements of gait to a side plank. So gait doesn't have to be the actual replication of walking, right? So load carry is an exercise. It's the same thing I go with deadlift. You know, a deadlift is an exercise. It, you know, a hip hinge doesn't have to be a deadlift. It's like that horrible SAT question everyone tells you, right? It's, you know, yeah. train leaves at four and another one, no. But, you know, when you <laughs> just start thinking about that way, you're like, oh, okay. Like, we're really talking about movement. We're not talking about muscles because I think what we do is we then we take a idea of like a squat and we think about the muscles that make up a little squat. And we start dissecting the body again. And that's not how the body works. So I think it's also thinking about how all these sort of patterns start to, you know, work together and to become seamless. Like, how do you make something that's as complex as gait look seamless? Because people don't think of it that way, but it's the most complex pattern out of those seven by far. That's why there's very few animals that can walk on two feet. Interesting. Right? Yeah. And so it, and so it's it's one of those things, like, you got to start with that. So, like, what makes up gait? And when you ask coaches that, like, they can break down a power clean in no one's business. They can tell you all the ins and outs of a cowbell swing. Most can't tell you how we walk. It's true. Which is like, but we all do that. And, 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 and it's not even necessarily coaches' faults, per se, because, I you know, I've been, you know, I went to the university, you know, programs. I went to, you know, continuing education, and CSCS, and no one ever taught us how to analyze gait. And I went to my wife who's a physical therapist. I'm like, okay, let, let's come up with a few pointers that we can teach coaches about gait. And she gave me this stupid husband comment look. Like, that was a stupid comment. <laughs> and she's like, that's at least a semester in physical therapy school and blah, 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 blah. I'm like, okay, okay, not helpful, but let's come up with a couple of concepts still. Um, like, we're not going to make people professional gait analysis, but like, what are concepts we can bring away? And that's where we started to build out our system, like reverse engineer it. Like, instead of trying to do these exercises let's really focus on how people move and function and try to make those connections because when i asked you know when i talked to a university or professional strength coach it's like what's the job of a strength coach and they'll give me the answer to make people strong and i'm like no but that's not your job your job is to improve the efficiency in which way they move which is uh, producing power producing reactive strength things like that you're trying to improve the efficiency you're assuming strength relates to efficiency, and that may or may not be the case, right? Yeah. Because why do you not then see that performance carry over to a sport? As you didn't improve their efficiency, you improved a quality that may or may not have been relevant to what they're actually needing. So when you put in those terms, I think people start to think about, okay, well, what are what is it that we're trying to do, and what you know, where how do our concepts change, how do our, our principles change, and you know, that's why if you look at it from the gate perspective, Anthony. That's why we don't sit on machines. That's why we don't sit on benches, because everything comes from the ground up. You know, you, you and I were talking about Gary Gray. Gary does have this great concept called chain reaction. And he's right. Everything comes from the ground up. And so if we don't understand how that transition impacts the entire body, and we're sitting on benches and machines and trying to isolate and do this, that, it just is going against how our body wants to work. So I never like understood this argument from the, you know, you're talking about the two communities. There's the one side that goes, we don't need to change anything. Everything we're doing is fine. You're just trying to make things unnecessarily complicated. You're just trying to sell me stuff. I'm like, okay, but you have to understand again the history of fitness. So an old time bodybuilder, you know, early nine, 1900s, yeah, they were lifting some weights, but they were also doing gymnastics and wrestling. So they were doing a lot more movement mm. than people think when they think of bodybuilding and even their bodybuilding at the time wasn't sitting there in a preacher curl. Like there's a lot more handstand stuff and there's a lot more training, integrated training. So this idea that's always been done this way, I'm like, which way? Cause you also got to say like, what country were you in? I mean, you know, it wasn't like Arthur Saxon was posting on Facebook wait to Eugene Sandow, what he was doing for his walk that day. You know, it was like, you know, you had this mass, break so i mean what was being done in one country is different than so i hate when people go it's always been done this way it's like no what you're familiar with is been done that way what you know like most people don't know that the 
barbell the way people see it now. It was designed in the 1930s by York Barbell. Guess what their company sells? Barbells. Barbells. Mm -hmm. So it's funny, like, why don't people look at the barbell as being a, a, you know, what you're sort of using the same analogy, just this piece of equipment people were trying to sell. True. It's been around for less than 100 years. It was made by a equipment company. Yeah. So what makes it more valid than anything else? Yeah, true. Um, because you can also try to trace the like the use of the barbell to being different too. So before York, York sort of standardized the barbells we know it now, other companies were making barbells, but they were much smaller. What happens to a barbell as it gets longer? You load it more. When you start loading it more, you stop doing what? You stop moving as much because you become more unilaterally. You can only move in so many directions with a heavy load. And so the way we started training, I mean, it hasn't been done all this way. It's been done this way a very short time. And guess who the first strength coaches were? Powerlifters and Olympic weightlifters. So guess what most people were trained as? <laughs> yeah. I mean. Yeah. So... So the idea of functional training is, is really an education in helping people understand how the body works. And if we if we all agree how the body works, then we can start creating solutions. And to me, an exercise is just a solution to a problem. Yeah, you know, it's interesting you brought up gait too, and because uh, you know I, I haven't really heard anybody really talk about that. Like, yeah, we need to get that. I have from the physical therapist, like your wife said, oh, this is a you know this is a whole thing. But meanwhile, so many strength coaches are willing to talk about sprinting and sprinting <laughs> mechanics, right? You got to walk yeah. before you run, and then yeah. like what you were saying, even you can break it down even more <laughs> to you know these pa- these other patterns the side plank and the and the uh the crawling to kind of work that pattern it's really interesting that we kind of lump that into the physical therapist uh category oh yeah i mean i, I get a kick out of it because i'll get co- coaches that get all worked up and they'll be like oh you can't they'll, they'll borrow the great cook line i think they misunderstand what great actually means but uh they'll use the line uh, don't don't load dysfunctional movement which from a sound bite perspective sounds like awesome advice but then people are doing loaded carries. And I'm like, why are you doing loaded carries? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, why are you doing loaded carries? So to fix their core. Did you watch how they walk first? Do you know if they walk well? And they just look at me like I just, you know, gave them the Da Vinci code. Like, what do you mean? How do they walk well? well he, he walked here, but he, you know, okay, they walked here, but they, you know, from their car to here, but they may have not done it well. Like, we can all squat badly. We can still squat, right? And people don't even, so the point is like, yeah, the most coaches are unarmed with the information to really make a strong decision and understand what functional training means. And I'll be the first to admit, if you ask me all the ins and outs of gait, I am not a gait expert, but I know enough to start putting the pieces together to start, you know, thinking about how we can make them better in the gym. And I think, you know, we write off things like gait because as coaches, we want control. We love controlling things. And I'm like, but strength, I can control. I can make you a better squatter. And, you know, I'm going to tell you that makes you better at gait. I don't really know. It's kind of like that, you know, example I gave you the car again. I'm hoping it makes you better. It might make you better, but I, I'm guessing really. Yeah, it's so true. You're right. Oh, you know, you don't put strength on top of dysfunction, but yeah, you're right. Like we're so willing to do carries right away day one, because we feel like it's just, you know, safe exercise for everybody to do, but technically we're really, we're probably not doing, doing the right thing. It's interesting. Um, yeah, yeah, it's 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 my it's, it's funny when you put in that context, people just look at you and you know you know how it is. I mean, one of two things happen: they become more intrigued with what you're saying, or they get frustrated and they just write you off. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's interesting how it sort of simulates one of two reactions. Yeah, when you tell me that I'm I've been doing it wrong this whole time, if I'm not prepared to hear that, I could either say, "Well, Josh is an idiot," or yeah, yeah or like you said, he's trying to sell me his product, so he's gonna yeah. he's gonna sell me his gate his gate ebook. Um, right. <laughs> but, but, um, well, let's move on. What, what I want you yeah. to talk, like, let's, let's go over, you know, before we get to progressive overload, cause I told you progressive overload, the way right. you explain progressive overload and, uh, getting into working the different planes of motion. I think I haven't heard anywhere else in that kind of detail. And so I want to get some overview of that, but give everybody this, def- you know, in defense of the sandbag, like why the sandbag? Sure. I, you know what? And I, I, I've come to start answering that with a question, so bear with me with the way I respond. Because, I mean, I was on another podcast recently, and it's a very valid question. The, the guy was, the gentleman was asking me, he's like, you know, I have a barbell, I have kettlebells, why do I need a sandbag? And my question back is, why do you need a barbell, why do you need a kettlebell? Yes. <laughs> so true. Uh, I mean, if you're just telling me it's all weight, then why do you have a kettlebell and a barbell? 
true. You know, so I mean, so the answer to your question is, whenever I say, you know, do you need a sandbag? And my first answer is no, you don't. I say, you know, you're the reason we have, you know, these two different delineations, DBRT and our ultimate sandbag, is it was like probably almost a decade ago now. I was talking to Alan Cosgrove, and I'm like, you know, people are getting fixated on the implement, and they're not focusing on what we're doing with it. Yes. You know, we need to sort of differentiate the two. Because if I ask most people, Anthony, like, is the sandbag good? If I ask most coaches, is the sandbag good? Most of them would say, yeah. And they'll be like, I'll be like, why? And they're like, oh, because it's unstable. And I'm like, what does that do? Uh, I don't know. And, or, or I'll be like, okay, it's unstable. Okay, cool. You think it's useful? Do you use it? No. Why not? I don't know. Like, so you're telling me it's good. You're telling me it does something unique, but you don't think there's enough value for you to actually use it. And I'll tell you the truth, Anthony. Here's the truth. I've had a lot of well-known coaches. I'm not going to, like, you know, give away their privacy because I admire them for asking. They're like, I just don't know what to do with this thing. Yeah. So I think, you know, a lot of people, it's just a factor. And so that's what we try to do because when people go, I love sandbag triangle. No, you don't. And they're like, look at me shockingly. And like, what do you mean you don't love sandbag triangle? Okay, what are the principles of sandbag triangle? And they look at me again like I just spoke Chinese to them. Like, what do you mean principles? I'm like, well, there's principles to this. What, what, what are the principles? You don't love sandbag training. You like to use a, something that gives you a, a variance, but you're using it just like your barbell. And I don't, I don't blame them because I did that first, too, and I was about yeah. to abandon the whole idea when I'm like, well, what are we doing here? Why is this a tool? Is this a useful tool? I asked myself those questions. Like, is this necessary? So we started looking at, like, what are the unique attributes, and then what are we able to do better that we can't do with anything else? And, and one of the biggest things is just to make connections to the body better, to make connections to the chains better, to give feedback to the body better, and to challenge the body in very unique ways. And so, you know, it's hard to describe when you haven't felt it because of Alan's reaction. I think it's ridiculous. Like, you know what your problem is? I'm like, I got a laundry list, but you, you go ahead. He goes, you have to feel it to get it. And I'm like, yeah, that's kind of a tough thing to ask people, especially nowadays in the social media world where we're making a first impression from a video or a post or things like that. It's, it's hard to get it. Or if you're not using it with the right intent, it's like, you know, I, I don't want to be the police of sandbag train, but there's people that, po- that tag me lots of things and they're well-meaning, but they're doing them horribly wrong. And it's like correcting them. It's like I'm correcting them so they can get the benefit out of it, not because I want to be the sandbag police. Like the only reason I want people to use this is so they get a benefit they couldn't get any other way. So my answer is like, why did people, you know, need our system or need our product? It's like if they if they follow the system, they'll find changes in the way they train, and they'll find changes in the results that they get, and the way they're able to address problems that they aren't able to do with anything else. So that's my long and short answer at the same time. Yeah. And uh, like for me, if I had to defend the sandbag after kind of reading, you know, not going through the whole course, but this idea that it gives me to me, it gives me the most options as well from the progressive resistance we're going to get into because I think you guys have done an amazing job in terms of like there's so many different holding positions, you know, body positions. We can, you know, we can pretty much do with a lot of a lot of other things, but also. The ultimate sandbag, like what you were talking about, there it's like they're alive. Actually, can you give that descript that that example that Alan Cosgrove talked about the the bags being alive? Yeah, I mean, I think you know one, two attributes. Like people always assume sandbags are unstable, and that's not true. Um, you know, they can be either stable or unstable, and one of the unique attributes they have to that is the role dimension plays. Mm-hmm. So most other implements, like a barbell, a barbell never changes its dimension, really. It's the same size every single time. Uh, with the sand, with ultimate sandbags, we have different sizes, not just to have different loading parameters, but to have different dimensions. So different dimensions allow you to do different exercises, to create different tension patterns, to make an, to make an exercise alive or not. And they, what you're asking about the live thing is, so most people want, if you, again, went back to the functional training concept, they, they want training for life. And you go, is life perfect? Is life predictable? Is everything you do, you know, the same? And they're like, no, no, it's always changing. And blah, blah, blah. Like, I'll give you an example. People say they need, you need to deadlift so you can pick up your kid, right? Have you ever heard that one? Of course. Like, along those lines? Yeah. Does your kid, when you go to pick them up, put their arms right down their side, lock up, brace, and stay perfectly still so you can pick them up? <laughs> no. Like, you, you have a new dog. And, you know, we've had dogs for years. Like, if you need to pick up your dog, you need your dog. is going, okay, hold on. Let me get prepared so you can, like, lift me perfectly stable. Yeah. You know, that doesn't happen. And so, like, we create this reliance on on predictability in the gym. I mean, the Soviet Union used to have this whole idea of imperfection training. 
where they realized that there was a gap between what was done in performance and what was done in the gym. And I'm not saying everything needs to be crazy, but we do need to get people to start to understand that, you know, one of the things that we recommend free weights for versus machines is why? Because we don't want pattern overload. We don't want to get the locked into the exact same pattern because then we develop imbalances and compensations, right? Well, the same thing happens when we use very stable implements all the time. It's like it cracks me up when I get people that have a good barbell base training background or kettlebell training. And we give them some of our DVRT drills where the weights are a little bit more alive, and they can be alive in a couple ways. One, they can be alive in their actual movement. So, like a max lunge, where you know we're lunging the back swing around our body. Well, there's not too many times we're moving in one direction, the weight's moving in a different one, right? Yeah. In a clean squat press, like the weight's moving with our body. Right. Yeah. But now during the max lines, we're having to produce force and resist force at the same time, you know, or it could be the way we're positioning. So if I go into a shoulder squat, for example, which sounds like a pretty easy drill. Well, now I have a sagittal plane exercise being challenged into the frontal plane thrust. So a lot of people, they, you know, have compensation and lateral sway or rotation of their pelvis because they don't have the ability to move in the sagittal plane while resisting a frontal plane stress. Which, you know, if we really ate back to the whole gate thing, like people would be like, well, who cares? In gate, we move in what? All three points of motion at once. So something we do all the time without thinking about it, we do seamlessly. But when it comes to the gym, if you take most people out of this agile plane, they just completely fall apart. And so it's one of those things like, again, we have to understand what we're trying to develop function for. If you're trying to develop function for powerlifting, great. But again, I've had powerlifters where I've improved their squats by making them more frontal plane strong because, as the saying goes, you're only as strong as your weakest link, right? And if you can't, can't if you can't stabilize the transverse and frontal plane, then your sagittal plane strength is going to be inhibited. So it can be alive in a lot of different ways. It can be alive in the body positions, like we talked about. If you now make yourself slightly unstable and now you're moving with a weight that just changes the stability just enough because here's the thing about stability you and I are sort of alluding to with some of the BOSU stuff the stability needs to be as incremental as a load in volume the problem with the BOSU isn't that it's stupid it's this and that it's that it's dramatically unstable so like imagine if I went and deadlifted to 100 pounds and the next set I'm deadlifting 500 pounds you would say that wasn't very progressive yeah. but that's what we do to people and, and, and the BOSU is not the only environment we do that in we do that to people by taking them from a bilateral deadlift into a single leg deadlift right? Mm -hmm. That's a giant jump in stability change, and that's why so many people fail, and that's why they do these lousy single-leg deadlifts, and we don't have better progressions because they're changing these attributes way too fast, and you said that understanding the progressive overload, when you understand progressive overload, you understand that barbell is the most limited one of all the tools to actually use all the progressive overload principles because it's largely a sagely plane implement that moves in one plane of motion and is usually functions best just when you add or decrease weight. But you look at most of the other tools, they don't function that way. I'll give you an example, Anthony. Like, what, what's the one free weight tool that actually changes its physical weight? The one free weight tool that changes its weight? Yeah. I um, I can't think. Like, the barbell, right? What's that? The barbell, right? Oh, yeah, that you can you actually, you oh, yeah, that. you can yeah. put more on in one thing. Yeah, oh, yeah. okay, yeah, yeah. That, do you do that with your medicine? Do you do that with your medicine balls? No, no, you don't add like uh, uh, any. Yeah, you don't. <laughs> there's nothing you put you in a med with, ball. Yeah. You do that with a band. No, yeah, you just use that one band. Yep. How about how about kettlebell? Nope. How about dumbbell? The only time I could throw you on that one, I guess, is uh, those magnets, those little uh, weight right, pads. Right. <laughs> I mean, but, but it's pretty limiting, right? Most yeah, people don't, right? They just yeah, have more of them. Exactly. So the the reason I bring that up is because what if I what if we shifted this to a business discussion and I said, Anthony, I'm going to base 100% of my business on 10% of what I do. That wouldn't make a lot of sense, would it? No. But that's what we've done to strength training. We've based everything off the, the, the exception, not the rule. Almost none of our other tools function the same way as barbell, but we want to base everything off of what the barbell does. Yeah, that's a good point. Good so, I mean, I'm asking people to do something big. I'm asking them to think very differently. But again, if you look at the history of strength training, it's not actually a massive leap because that's actually what people used to do all the time for lots of different reasons, not necessarily because they just had more science or they understood science there. Sometimes it was just out of necessity, but 
you know, I, I think we have this really skewed understanding of strength and what we're trying to do for performance and all these things just because we're stuck in these uh, sound bites that we never actually challenge or think about. It's true. And so let's use one of them in that. I think like mm-hmm. to, to go deeper into progressive overload, you like you were saying, we all relate this to just adding weight to a bar or, yeah. you know, like, hey, it's progressive overload. You just, you know, th- to this yeah. week, we're going to just add two pounds to the bar every week. It doesn't work like that. Can you go over all like you were talking about nine variables and progressively building intensity? Talk to us about that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I was of the same ilk, so I don't want to pretend like I'm better than everybody. Yeah. Is. I mean, a lot of these things just came from my own process of just working through stuff myself. Um, you know, if you look at the textbooks, progressive overload is never defined as solely a measure of a weight increase or decrease. In fact, I think it's uh, uh, Dr. Sis Super Train that actually criticizes that mentality and then talks about the fallacy of the whole Milo and the bull type of uh, thing. Because, I mean, um, Anthony, how long have you been working out for? Uh, wow, 30, a little over 30 years, probably. Okay, how long have you known how to deadlift? Uh, I'm still working on that. But yeah, not probably huh. probably over the last, really, truly over the last, I got in the fitness business, maybe last uh, to 12, 15 years. 12, 15 years, that's a good amount of time, right? Mm-hmm. What, what's, what's your best deadlift? Uh, best deadlift has been like 350. Okay, that's a good deadlift, right? So why isn't it two thousand pounds? Because I didn't do it. Every because day. I mean, if, if we, <laughs> well, if we break it down, if we break down the amount of years you've known how to do it, yeah, and look at your and where you started from with it, which I don't know where you started from, but you know, if we look at like how much how much you've improved in that 12, 15 years, why why aren't why don't you see people? Why aren't we seeing powerlifters deadlift five thousand pounds? Yeah, true. I mean, if if linear loading works in such a terrific way we should see these lows go through the roof. Mm-hmm. So progressive overload has never been about that. Progressive overload, if you look at the textbooks, always emphasizes stressing the body greater than before. So we, we innately have other mediums in which we do that, right? One easy one is volume, right? The amount of reps we give, right? That's another easy one. Okay, mm-hmm. so we have volume, we have load. Load is one of them. But then we have also time under tension, speed of movement, range of motion, point of motion, you know, holding position, body position. I'll give you an example. Like people get the body position one funny to me. I'm like, yeah, because you no know, gymnasts never change their body position to make an exercise easier or harder. Well, we don't use a TRX or a suspension trainer to make body position easier or harder. But why don't we do that with an external load? And then all of a sudden you start to see that we have all these different variables. And so what ends up having is not just having more options, which is great, but it's also understanding that we can be drastically increasing the intensity on our clients without knowing it and causing them to plateau because we're not aware of the other variables we're introducing to them without thinking them as progressively as we would reps or weight. So like, again, it's important to understand how all those variables work. And so, you know, at first I always tell people, listen, if you've never been thinking about your body position, then just start there, just do that. Right. And then slowly as you become more familiar with it, you can add a different variable that maybe you weren't considering in the past. If you try to do everything at once, it becomes overwhelming. I call it the Starbucks effect. Right. If you can remember the first time you walked into Starbucks, and you just wanted coffee and then you get all these options. Like you walk right out. Right. Like we don't we as humans don't do better with more options. We do worse. Yeah. So it's like, OK, if you haven't been aware of these other things and these aren't Josh things, these are actually textbook things and training things that uh then then you start uh, over time understanding like how how incomplete a lot of our programming progressions and and exercises actually are and that it's nice to sit in this little bubble and feel really confident that we know a couple things really well but i always say i can always tell a great coach from an average coach because if i take away your favorite exercise can you still coach me well and for a lot of coaches you can't if you take away their favorite exercises they don't know what to do with you and it's like, I don't have a favorite exercise. And the whole thing about us having a system is, I always tell people, you don't have to do every exercise, you have to do the right exercise. So our whole goal with having a system is to give you direction. How do you start to understand what that right exercise is? And a little bit of trial and error, I'm not going to lie, it's not. That's where the art comes in. But at least you have direction. You can probably communicate to me, this is why I'm selecting this exercise. This is why I'm trying to address a lot of people. They're just saying something new and going, I'm going to do that because I haven't done that before or that. I mean, we still, we can't help ourselves bodybuilding, man. Like you probably see it all the time. We still talk about glutes as though they work by themselves. We talk about rotator cuffs as though they work by themselves. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like we just chose better muscles to talk about instead of, I don't know, pecs and arms and biceps, right? Yeah. 
It's so true. Um, Josh, just give everybody an example of like with just with the holding position. For example, when you talk about the press out, the bear hold and the bucket and, and how sure. you how you differentiate those and progress those and where people are within that. Sure. Probably an easy example of that, like you're saying, is, is a sort of a squat progression. And people always ask, like, what, when are we going to barbell squat? And I, I don't. I agree with Coach Boyle. I don't think it's necessary outside of someone who's a power lifter. Um, but it, let's, let's talk about your average client coming in, all right? Because most of us are not training power lifters. And this even goes for an athlete, right? Because you, you and I both know athletes are not great lifters, per se. Yeah. They're great at their sport. They're not great lifters. So, so let's say Susan comes in. She's a 40-year-old woman. And you ask her to body weight squat. And you see the hot mess that most of us are used to seeing. It's not anything bad on Susan. She's just, you know, she's got flexion everywhere. You know, she's off balance. Her knees are caving in and, and so forth. So at first, you know, as everyone goes, oh, I'm going to have this massive corrective phase. This is going to be frustrating. It's going to take a long time. We're going to have to mobilize that and stretch this and activate that versus just understanding what's going on. So the most dominant pattern we all have as humans when we feel threatened is going to flexion. It's a startle reflex, right? If you think about that baby going fetal. Mm -hmm. So that's why you see your client flexing their elbows <laughs> when they are, are trying to pull a clean too early or a deadlift too early or they're rounding their shoulders. They're building flexion because they don't feel stable. So how do you create – so the question is how do you create stability for people? Well, there's – there's to me, it's like that core stability thing is a real thing, and core stability is 35 different muscles. It's not like your ass, it's not your back. It's all, everything working together. It's even your feet. It's even your hands because one of the big things we try to keep people on is this simple idea that, you know, kind of surprised people don't talk about it. Like where does force enter the body to your feet and your hands, right? Mm -hmm. What do we almost never coach people how to use their feet or their hands? Yeah. We tell them bend their knees, push their hips back. We do all these things, but we never, and here's the thing, where, where are over half the bones in your body? And your feet and your hands. Yeah. So they must be pretty important. Yeah. <laughs> they must be important for a reason. Yeah. Right. So so the way we actually so you know, how do we, how do we get people to create core stability? So we know core stability is important. How do we do it? Like it's not like, you know, rush hour if I keep, you know, yelling core stability, activate your core louder and louder, you know how to do it better, right? Like I actually need to tell you how to do it. So how do we get people to activate their core and get that core stability is through their hands and their feet? So if we get people, I know a lot of people have been talking about this now, about grabbing the ground with their feet, that's great because that creates that chain reaction up. But we have also a chain reaction down, right? So, you know, we'll begin, you know, teaching what a press out. Press out, people can imagine. We're holding a smaller back vertically, about belly button height. And as I squat down, I'm pushing the weight out. Now, people always ask, can I use a plate? Can I use a kettlebell? Can I use this and that? I'm not claiming you can't, but the reason we're using the bag is because what we're doing with the hands. We're actually breaking the weight apart. If you just imagine, if you just sit there and simulate, if you just try to break something apart, you notice your elbows come to your ribs and something becomes active, which is your lats. Right? We don't think the lats is a big core stabilizer, but they're huge. Mm -hmm. Right? They have that. They have an influence with the obliques, the glutes, you know, the shoulder, the pelvis. Like they're main core stabilizers. So we gotta get those lats engaged. So the whole point is by breaking the bag apart and creating that hand tension, we have now lat engagement. Now we have core tension as we start to go out, press out. So it's timing a little bit. So we use that to teach them how to brace, how to create tension, how to have that bike control. All of a sudden you see much better squats. Well, why is that? Because we're taking away the body startle reflex. So once they can do that for a little bit, because there's always so much we can load because when we press out the weight in front of us, we have a long lever arm. Yeah. So we're not going to increase weight, increase weight. So we're going to bring the weight closer to us. So we'll start with what's called a bear hug squat. And outwardly, a lot of people think it looks like a goblet squat, which it, I can understand. But what's the limiting factor in a goblet squat? It's how much you can hold, right? Yeah. So here's the thing. Like, So I used to do competitive strongman. And uh, not necessarily well, but I did it. And I remember I, I used to train with a guy who was a world's strongest man competitor. He, when we were train stones he always had the cue that when you lifted a stone you wanted to be like a crane not the bird but the machine and so you want to make it a part of your body and so when you actually make the weight a part of your body in a bear hug you take away the limitation of holding the weight you're actually making it a part of your body and when i try to break the bag apart guess what i activate the entire chain again mm -hmm. but because the weight's closer to my body i can start to load my body more but because of the dispersion of the weight now i actually have a very upright vertical squat without actually having to cue very much. I can cue, I can spend my time coaching very specific and simple things and increase performance very quickly. And then if I change this very quickly to a front load, so a front load, you know, people always want to say it's a zerker, but it's not. 
because in a zercher squat, because the barbell doesn't change its dimension, you can create tension against it, right? Yeah. So the bags, because they have dimension, we can create tension against it. So one of our cues is to break the bag apart with our forearms, and all of a sudden you get activation to the entire chain again. And so now we have basically a standing plank. That's why we call it front load. We want to think about a front plank. Just like I would create tension in the ground with the front plank, I'm creating tension in the back. And so, again, now I have a more, I don't have a mechanical advantage with the weight. Now the weight's now pulling me into flexion more, it's challenging my integration, my core and pelvis more. Like I love what Coach Boyle talked about, you know, his big reason that he's anti-back uh, squat was because if your core, your, your legs can only create as much force as your pelvis can stabilize, right? Mm-hmm. And that makes so much sense because, I mean, Dr. McGill talks about it with the upper body too and the whole rule of core stability. So if, if we're... You know, if we're actually taxing lumbar spines and we're, you know, doing all these other things, we're not actually making people stronger for when they can go out and perform better. Does that make sense? So yeah, we're absolutely. actually, our whole, our whole system is we're, we're building the pattern and then we're challenging the pattern. And we're challenging the pattern both through loading and different holding positions because eventually we get to, like we talked about that shoulder position, which is now a multi-planer squat. I'm moving in the sagittal plane. I'm resisting frontal plane forces. Can I do that well or now do I have a disconnect? So what good is it to me as an athlete if I can squat all this weight, but you put you know, 50 pounds on my shoulder and I completely shift and laterally move or rotate my pelvis? Because I'm not going to do that perfectly balanced squat when I go out and perform. I'm probably going to have to be redirecting force or having force come at different sectors and so forth. So it's one of those things like we have to start thinking about strength differently because the probably the biggest form of strength that athletes need is the ability to resist force, mm-hmm. right? Injury comes from lack of deceleration. And Coach Dose talks about this all the time. But it's hard to quantify. So what we end up doing, we talk about force production. Force production is far less of a problem than force resistance because even if you want to increase more force, I have to be able to resist force first, right? Like going back to Coach Boyle's example, if I can't stabilize my body, my body's going to shut down the nervous system to protect itself, so I'm not going to exude maximal force. So what am I really trying to accomplish in these exercises? And that's, I know I'm like babbling a little bit, but like I'm trying to like get people to think. Like I always, I always ask the question, I heard this on the radio by a famous radio guy. He's like, I'm not telling you what to think. I'm asking you, do you want to think? And we have to start questioning as we learn more about what the body wants to do and supposed to do. Are we actually training it for strength or are we training it to be great in the gym? Yeah, that's, that is really uh, the key right there. And I think it's, it's a similar thing when you talked about fluid, fluid resistance, um, Mm -hmm. like, and I forget who the quote was from, like athletes will encounter a dynamic resistance in the form of an opponent as compared to the static resistance. And because that active fluid resistance Resistance enhances the need for stability and control. This type of training may reduce the opportunity for injury because of improved joint stability. So you want to talk about transfer of training. This is where it's at. Yeah, and it's super hard because it's super hard to go brag on on social media about, you know, you getting owned by 80 pounds. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. (laughs) It doesn't get the likes, that thing. I just hit PR of 700 pounds, like, right? Or, yeah. you know, it's it's all these things. But, I mean, I, I'll give you one more example really quickly. I know we're short on time, but, like, you know, I don't – I don't I like landmines for some of the rotation work. I hate pressing because, you know, people will tell me, well, they're going to do a landmine press because people don't have shoulder mobility. Well, here's the problem. What happens to the weight of a landmine as you press the weight up? Does it get easier or harder? It's, it's going to be easier. It gets easier, right? Yeah. It's like, you know, I use it now just like flipping a tire. You only have to get a tire so high. Yeah. You don't actually flip the whole thing either, right? Mm-hmm. So, so okay, so when I press something overhead, does the weight, does my body brace harder or less when the weight goes over my head? More. More. Yeah. So I'm using a reverse strength curve to fix a mobility problem? Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't make any sense. That's mm-hmm. why people try to attach bands to landmines because they realize it's problems the problem with people going all overhead like and the whole thoracic mobility issue is like you know i'm doing my presentation this year for perform better like about you know strength for mobility okay your thoracic spine is uh, is, uh, is all tight why 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 is the thoracic spine tight it's just decide that's tuesday so it's time to be tight mm-hmm. well and if you go the you know grays and mike's you know joint by joint if you don't have good core stability you won't have good what Thoracic. thoracic mobility. Yeah. So doing a landmine press isn't fixing any of that. Yeah. 
So that's why we do other variations and we get people pressing overhead pain free much faster. So again, it's just understanding what are they actually doing, what actually happens because one of the reasons we emphasize overhead pressing is because it's an extended plank. Right? Yeah. I have at that position, I'm having to resist extension. And and to press up, I have to push my body down. Just like I do in a plank, I have to push my body down in the ground. So the, the, the point I'm trying to make is this: people don't actually, they focus on what the weight's doing and they have, they forget what the body's doing. Yeah. So true. So true. Good stuff. Um, and there's plenty more of this in the course. I, not that I'm not yeah. trying to plug the course, I'm just trying to show people how valuable uh, this stuff is. And there's a lot of interesting points that Josh makes to make you think about what we're doing in the gym. And one of those things was planes of motion. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, a lot of times we say, oh, look, we're just going to do this exercise. We're going to do like, for example, a lunge matrix, like to coin Gary Gray stuff. You know, we're going to do them all on the same day because we're fine. We're going to do a a sagittal lunge and then a, 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 frontal lunge and then a, a, a rotational lunge, a transverse lunge. Right. Um, but you guys don't move blindly from one plane to another. You have more of a progression. Can you go over how you properly progress these planes of motion? Sure. And it really starts back going in the back of that gate idea. Like, okay, so in gate, the thing that we all do, we have all three planes of motion active, but how are those three planes of motion working? And so we think about like the sagittal plane, and this is where the old old time coach gets all grumpy. Like, I, I don't believe in this multi planer stuff. This is it's bogus. Just get strong. Just lift stuff. Yeah. But it's like it's like if your surgeon said, just cut stuff. Um, it'd be a little bit horrifying. Um, but like the idea is that we actually have to stabilize in these different planes. They have to work cohesively. So the sagittal plane in my world is not a bad guy. Like I think sometimes in these quote unquote functional training camps, the sagittal plane becomes a bad guy, right? Oh, don't, don't, don't do sagittal plane work. No, sagittal plane is important because it's the most stable plane. And so we can build foundational patterning. We can build foundational strength. Like if I have someone who doesn't move well or doesn't understand how to do a movement pattern, I need to start them into a stable environment. It's like, I'm going to teach you calculus, Anthony, but I'm not going to teach you addition and subtraction first. Like that doesn't make any sense. Mm-hmm. But then, you know, where we go with it is going, okay, well, you know, in gate, I have to resist the frontal plane, right? I don't actually move through it. It's, it is, it's a little tricky. Like, you know, even the lateral band walks is really tricky because group beats, like no one walks around having to look flying out the now outside their body. It's the, the whole goal is those muscles stabilize the pelvis from side to side. So it's like, okay, now, you know, can I be in positions like, you know, you know simple example is a half kneeling position, right? In a half kneeling position, I'm starting to teach you how to resist the frontal plane. And then, and then, you know, we can talk about resisting the, you know, transverse plane, but then we start moving through those planes. And to us, the highest level of sort of athleticism and functional fitness is that multi-planer. I'll give you an example because, you know, when I start to strength coaches, what, what's the, they, 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 I do multi-planer work. I do lateral lunges. Right. That's always the go to like mm-hmm. multi planer yeah. you know, token exercise. I'm like, well, that's not multi planer. That's just planer dominance in a different direction, right? You're still predominantly going laterally. You're not integrating the other planes. So for us, like the reason our max lunge, when we're, you know, lunging one direction and the weight's moving around us, is such an important exercise in our world is because I ha- I'm starting off with the weight in the frontal plane. It's coming around me. I'm resisting the transverse plane. I have to still produce force in the sagittal plane to extend my hips and to produce the force upwards, but then I have to come back, resist the transverse plane plane as I decelerate, and it ends up that I have to catch it back in that frontal plane. There's a lot of things going on there. Yeah. But if I didn't, if I just, but if if Monday morning I saw that exercise, and I don't know do that with my clients. I'll give you a real world example. This happened to me. I went to a conference, and a coach came up to me like, "Hey, you know, I I, I try to do your max lunge. I really like it, but um, my clients they they can't do it." I go, did you do the progressions? And they said, the what? All they saw was next size. They didn't know how we got there. Yeah. You know, and I mean, in the 30 second video on social media, it's hard. You can't go through your system. But like, it's a, it, our, our goal with social media is to start a conversation. Like, okay, well, you think that's interesting? What, like, do you understand what's going on? Like, and Max Lunch is a dynamic lift and chop. Yes. And so, like, people people forget these things. But they don't see them in bigger pictures. I'm like, I'm trying to get people, like, can you see this from a bigger perspective than I should squat? Like, okay, I should squat. Which one? I should deadlift. Okay, which one? We have over 15 ways to deadlift. 
which one should I be doing? Which one am I trying to emphasize? Why am I doing this one? And so, you know, again, what ends up happening, unfortunately, is you get people that go, this sounds like too much work. But I love what Coach Doe says. He goes, well, that's kind of our job. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's, if you want to be a respected professional, you kind of have to have a good baseline of knowledge. I, and I don't think it's, and I tell people, I don't think it's complicated. My goal of the system is make it easy. The difference is it's just new. It's just a different way of thinking. So, so when I tell coaches, like, don't tomorrow try to change everything you're doing. Go through your workouts and go, how do you see this being represented from the exercise that you're assigning people? Do you see, like, how are you challenging to resist the frontal plane, the transverse plane? How are you starting to bring those in? Like, the transverse plane is the most complex plane to teach because we have to actually move our feet. As you know, being a golfer, right? it's, like, if you don't move your feet, the like, rotation might come from the pelvis. Uh, from the hips yeah and they're like you, you know how hard that is to teach people so like we have a whole progression of series like that you know and i'm surprised how many coaches like they they look at exercise and they call it rotational training and it's actually anti-rotation i'll give you a, a classic one right this one always makes me laugh so you know the lever bell maze is getting more popular right and so when people move it around their bodies standing still you know they start swinging around their body i'm sure you've seen it yeah um they'll call it rotational training like that's not rotational training that's anti-rotational training yeah the the it's what the body is doing, not what the weight is doing. Yeah. So the way we define the plane of motion is what is your body doing? Like, you know, I'll give you another example. Coach Dose and I have had this conversation many times. There's no such thing as a transverse plane lunge. You just can't do it because of your knee. Right? Yes. Like you, know, <laughs> you, you can't do a transverse plane lunge. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I'll give you a classic example because, you know, I've gone through a lot of the same stuff you have. You know, when we were going up the lunge matrix, if you lunge out to the side, right, that was a lateral lunge, right? That was mm -hmm. frontal plane. If you crossed over, that was a transverse plane lunge, right? Yeah. And I'm like, wait, is it? Or is it going frontal plane in the other direction? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's that's it's honestly where the confusion the gets, you know, like yeah. when, you, when you look at that, wait, what am I really doing there? Yeah, I mean, you, and it's okay. It's like certain exercises you can't do all the planes of motion because, like, again, I went one destroy my knee trying to, like, have it do rotation. Like, it's like when people, you know, you've seen it, I'm sure they turn and then they lunge. I'm like, no, no, you're still lunging in the sagittal plane. Yeah, you just turn yeah. first. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. It's not a transverse plane lunge. Exactly. So it, it just, it's just coming to understand, like, again, it, unfortunately, Anthony, and I know you're a big proponent of it, it's just, unfortunately, we don't have a agreed upon system as an industry where, you know, when you enter the industry, you get introduced to these concepts and you get people walk mm -hmm. through them and they get to spend time with them. It's like you're thrown into the mix. And now, like, I always joke, like, I'm glad I'm an old dude now, like, because it's an overwhelming amount of information out there. And if I just came to the industry today, I'd be like, I don't, oh, what? I'm there's 5 million things I'm supposed to be doing. Which one am I supposed to be doing first? Yep. And so, you know, one of my things I try to tell coaches is there's a lot of things that work, but you're going to have to learn to prioritize because you can't do them all. And so you have to start with the things that work best. And then, like, you know, as, I think in our industry, we like to find the obscure thing first and then work towards the obvious versus going with the obvious thing and then going to more obscure. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is true. There's so much information. And I think we get, you know, that old saying of trying to have our dessert before we have even our appetizer. And, um, you know, two of the courses that I, I think are imperative are CSFC and then your course, the DVRT, because oh, sure. you really, you really go over, you do a great job of kind of, you know, teaching the man to fish, right? Instead of just, you know, giving him the fish, going fishing with him that one time. You're teaching the man to fish, teach him, you know, because I will say too, you guys get the most trainers, people that take your courses that will post and like, hey, I'm playing with the the system this way i'm um, watch me watch this you know and they're just playing with it and they're showing it because yeah. you've taught them a system you see so many people posting what they're doing different things with the sandbag that it becomes obviously more than just working with the sandbag so um before i let you go i do we got a couple minutes here i just want you to give us an overview of DVRT because you do have the 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 restoration course uh out there and then um, your new course um, is what are you calling that? The it's low lift. It's actually a load integrated functional training. That's okay, a cool acronym. Okay, <laughs> yeah, the, the integrated <laughs> program too. There you go. Yeah. Um, so um, give us an overview of that. Of uh, you know where people you know where they would want to go in in terms of which one should they take first or where they are. 
I, I, I mean, we, we started uh, um, back in 2008 doing courses. And my goal, like, I, you know, I was probably had a lot of the same hesitations Coach Boyle did, where, like, if I'm going to do a cert, it's got to be something good and unique and really help people. Like, I don't, the last thing I need to do is be in that circle of, uh, here's another program. Um, so we started, our level one was just to build that foundation. Like, what happens, like, again, being a coach myself, what happens when you have that client come in, they, they want to lose 30 pounds, but they also hurt, or you have the athlete that wants to run faster, but by the way, their back's just a mess. And like, how do you actually take, take people from a foundation of movement and then how do you bring them up to a high level performance uh, in a system? And like, so that not everyone's doing the same thing, they're all doing the same movement, just at a different level. So our system is really easy. I mean, if you, if I could break it down, it's holding position, body position, play in motion. Mm -hmm. Of course we have like load and reps, but like, as far as things that people are unfamiliar with, like if you can get grasp, holding position, body position, play in motion, you're going to do really well. And then it just comes down to cueing. Like, where do we emphasize our cueing? Like the longer I've coached, the less I actually touch people, not because I don't like people, but because I don't need to, mm -hmm. the more conscientious I am with the words I use to communicate concepts and the faster they get results. So I wanted to have a program where people could walk away immediately, apply the information and make people better because, you know, we're in the results business, but we're also in the experience business. So if you take that person that thinks exercise has to hurt or they can't do it and all of a sudden they're succeeding, that's going to be a win for everyone. So our level one is really based around that. And there's probably concepts that people are so, are familiar with it in some respect because good movement is good movement. Uh, I'm not claiming to, inter you know, uh, invent movement. But then, you know, I, a lot of people also – because um, a couple, I have a spinal disease, so I have a, you know, everyone says degenerative spine. Like, I actually have a really bad degenerative spine. I just had my fifth spinal surgery. Um, like, so when I had my lumbar fusion, I rehab myself, and, like, the doctors couldn't believe how fast I rehabbed. And so I'm like, oh, this might be good to share with people. Like, how do you make people better so fast? And uh, so we developed a basic, I call it our non-corrective corrective exercise course. Because <laughs> I think when people hear corrective exercise, they go, oh, they roll their eyes. It's sort of like, I got to eat my vegetables, but I really want to eat my ice cream. They do it and they don't do it with the same. And so I think we change how people see uh, corrective exercise. And so when they do our restoration program, they're building strength and they're finding they're able to fill in holes that maybe they realized were there, but they didn't know how to address. And they're realizing how fast you can make people better. And if people don't hurt, they're going to keep training with you. I think we all sort of realize that, but we don't know how to help them. Um, and then our level two is, is pretty advanced. Like a lot of people want to do a level two to start with. I'm like, you have to understand everything's built off of layers. And our level two is where we do a lot more of the multi-planar work. We do a lot more of the rotational work. We do a lot of the stuff that obviously – if you've done a level one level and restoration, you're going to be prepared for it. But if you walk in day one, it's going to be very frustrating. Uh, and so all those courses are online because you know, we realize we're not going to be in everyone's backyard all the time, the perfect time. And we can also deliver more information if we're not limited by uh, the interaction of, of a day, right? I mean, I love working with people personally, but you know what it is. Like, you're limited with how many hours you have. So we can deliver more information. We just released uh, our lift program because a lot of people, they do ask, like, how do, how do I know to use a sandbag versus a kettlebell versus a uh, dumbbell or medicine ball? And so we really try to break down, like, how these tools fit together so that you can look at your toolbox and you know, like, why are you grabbing a wrench right now? What size wrench are you grabbing? Uh, and what you're trying to solve. So everything's based off like, what's the problem? Here's how we're going to try to create a solution. And this is how we add incremental layers. So if you like using kettlebells, your program bands and other tools, you, you'll find that we do that. And, you know, and I'll be very honest with you. The one implement we don't have in the program is the barbell, just because our experience is the most limited tool for people. And, uh, it, you know, my buddy of mine did a square foot analysis. It takes twice as many square feet to use a barbell than it does these other implements. So again, yeah. are you in a business setting? Are you doing what you think? Are you actually doing what's best or are you doing what you think is best? So if people are expecting us to show barbell deadlifts, they're going to be disappointed, but we do have rationale why we don't and we explain all that. And I think it makes a lot of sense. And I think, you know, it all goes back to can we deliver better results faster for the trainers because we do look at it as an investment. And being a coach, I know what it's like. So if you're going to invest your hard-earned money, you better get a lot out of it. And we like to believe we deliver on that. 
Absolutely. I can uh, certainly vouch for that. So, Josh, thanks so much for coming on and giving us an overview. Like I said, we've been doing this for an hour. It's a long train coach podcast interview, but we have, I do babble. it's okay. We, <laughs> this is only scratch the surface of what the course is about. Um, it's not complicated though. It's just, you know, there's some really great stuff in here that, uh, that I think, uh, you might not have heard before. So Josh, thanks for coming on today. Um, I appreciate it, Anthony, so much. Uh, it's a great platform to be a part of, like I said, and be able to discuss great shopping information, right? <laughs> Absolutely. All right, that's going to do it for episode 249 of the Strength Coach Podcast. Remember, you can try strengthcoach.com out for three days. Just a buck, you'll have access to all the articles, videos, and programs, as well as the best forum on that. It's the only place to have full access to Coach Boyle. He's on every day to access that offer. Go to strengthcoach.com. Click the Join Now button to get started on your trial. Special thanks to Chris Parr and the folks over at Perform Better right now. Remember the spend more, save more sale. You can double dip with lots of great items, including kettlebells, sandbags, med balls, and ropes. The next one-day seminar in Boston, March 16th, Martin Rooney, Sue Falsoni, and Mike Boyle. Check it out at performbetter.com. Thanks to Coach Boyle and Josh Hankin for sharing their insights and philosophies into the world of strength and conditioning and performance enhancement thanks to adam Doughty, tim robinson and train heroic head over to trainheroic.com start your free 14-day trial let them know i sent you they'll save 10 percent off your first year of the train heroic pro and elite edition alan cosgrove for the results fitness university business of fitness segment check them out at resultsfitnessuniversity.com diane vivas and functional movement systems check them out at functionalmovement.com My name is Anthony Rennie. You can go to continuefit.com for all my resources, including the show notes. Thanks again, and I'll speak to you next time.